People said that, uh, John is dead. Trash team. Replaced by Grix's shadow. What? Calm this so you may be thinking, Caleb, this is a Japanese gaming channel. Why are you making a video about magic? Uh, so first of all, the, the next review is coming. So just, just hold on, it's coming. These games are really long. I'm doing the best I can. The review's in the works. Secondly, my channel is still young. So if I wanted the ability to make the occasional like uh, off topic video in the future, I need to set that precedent now. And thirdly, Magic the Gathering is my lifestyle game of choice. It's something I think about literally every day and is just a huge part of my life I'd like to share with you guys. Specifically, I would like to share with you my favorite deck from my favorite format, Modern Jund. Jund is one of the few strategies so potent, so oppressive, that its name became a verb. You'll never overhear someone talking about how they got Abzand out of the game, or ever overhear the recanting of some bad beats the time they got humans so hard they had to sit on a donut for a week. No! No, sir! You got Junded. Turn one is all about sending a message, and nothing telegraphs to your opponent, hey buddy, you're about to get junded pretty f***ing hard, quite like opening with black cleave cliffs into hand disruption. This list is running a 3-2 split of Inquisition of Kozilek and Thoughtseize. While the exact split preference varies from person to person, the fact that Inquisition lacks the capacity to hit payoff cards in bad matchups like Karn and Primetime feels a lot worse than just paying the two life for Thoughtseize. Pro tip! Make sure you're running Lorewind Thought Seasons. While both printings do shock you, the Theros printing damages you twice. Once when it resolves and you lose two life, and again when it comes into your hand and you have to look at its disgusting illustration of Aristotle experimenting with opioids. Now that's Jundan I'm good. Alternatively, if we're not leading on discard, holding up mana for a fatal push or a lightning bolt on your opponent's end step is a pretty reasonable opening position. Push did enjoy its time in the sun, and while it still has a place in the deck, the fact that it can make for an underwhelming cascade hit paired with its inability to topple the rising number of Gurmag anglers and hollow ones has left it in a less favorable position. Presently, we're on a 4-1 split. Pro tip! If you're on the draw and have the option of either casting turn 1 hand disruption or killing a turn 1 mana dork, it's usually correct to kill the creature. Bolt the bird did not become a mantra just because it's catchy. That being said, the printing of Fatal Push has opened up some interactions to decisive flavor fails. I mean, technically speaking, you can Fatal Push a Birds of Paradise, but come, come, in our hearts, we know. Push the old lady, though. <laughs> uh, brutal. Now that's Jundanum Good. Our final one drop is a single copy of Grim Lava Mancer. This guy is an all-star repeatable source of damage that specializes in cleaning up unsightly mana dorks, creature tokens, and other assorted chaff, as well as provides a consistent way to chip in damage at your opponent and opposing planeswalkers. Now, you may think he doesn't play well with Tarmogoyf, exiling cards out of her own graveyard. I mean, yeah, that, that's it. He's a one-mana semi-sweeper in a format inundated with low-to-the-ground creature strategies. What do you want me to do? Put him in the board? the f*** out of here. Just be an adult, pick card types that you're doubled up on between you and your opponent's yards and start slinging shocks. As for our two mana removal, I would not recommend running any less than two terminate. One of the strongest removal spells in the format, an unconditional destroy target creature it cannot be regenerated at instant speed, feels good. That and when you're facing down a turn two Tasker, Gurmag Angler, God forbid a turn one hollow one, or any other assorted nonsense that is comically outside of bolt or push range, you are gonna be happy you did not skimp on terminates. Abrupt Decay, at the moment, is just a one of, and it's there to answer any number of irritating three or less mana permanents we're likely to encounter. That and the very relevant text, can't be countered by spells or abilities, is what drives this card from good to insane. It is also the reason for a non-zero number of awkward pauses I've experienced when a cocky blue-white player tries to cryptic counter draw my abrupt decay and we both stare at each other silently until they realize they done f***ed up. No takesies backsies, not in this dojo! Pro f*** 
blue players. Don't you also play Jessica? Shut up! Now that's Gundam good. Eventually, we're gonna want to begin establishing our board presence and our place out of Tarmogoy, the Mac Daddy of big dumb creatures. I don't care who you are, a two mana three four on turn two is pretty good. If you need me to explain to you why you're still spending 83-ish dollars each on this guy after being reprinted like clockwork three years in a row in Modern Masters, you may be buying into the wrong deck. Or just new to the format, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a dick here. Just... <sighs> so the way I see it, Jund, as a deck, is a harem anime. And Bob here is our unwitting protagonist. Like any good harem story, Bob finds himself drawing in a wonderful assortment of ladies, all equal parts dangerous and beautiful. Of course you got your Sado Dare, Kami Dare, and a few Ku Dare's, with Bloodbraid Elf being the unmistakable Tsundere of the group. If flipping a Bloodbraid Elf off a Dark Confidant trigger isn't the magic equivalent of him walking in on the elf changing and getting swiftly, dramatically uppercutted into orbit, leaving only a vapor trail of his blood as he disappears into the sun, I am not sure what is. So kind of joking, but not at all joking aside, Bob is the proverbial shovel with which we bury our opponent in card advantage. The power of drawing two cards a turn cannot be understated. Turn one hand disruption into turn two Bob is an opener I would snap keep blind every time. Scavenger Goose is the suburban raccoon of Magic the Gathering, gorging itself on the discarded leftovers from an ill-secured bin till it is nice and plump. This disgusting little scamp provides us with some main deck graveyard hate slash life gain, as well as a beat stick that grows in tandem with its waistline. How is this card even legal? I mean, it just does so much. We are happily running too, though I fully understand anyone who feels three is correct. Playing Liliana the Veil is not unlike putting your opponent through a rough divorce. Plus one, they lose their mind. Minus two, they lose their friends. Minus six, Ooh. Hey! I'll take half his shit! If left to her devices, she is a constant source of harassment for your opponent, single handedly keeping both her hand and board empty. It is my personal opinion that running any less than four is doing yourself a disservice. We have a single main deck copy of Liliana the Last Hope. You know, for the value. Not only is The Last Hope just a powerhouse of a planeswalker with a plus one that guns down X1s and an egg two that buys us back our threats, but she has an alt that both wins you the game and comes with a built-in theme song. And I will go ahead and alt my Lily. Capitalizing on the updated planeswalker rule allows you to create some powerful board states with two active Lilianas at the same time. In fact, I've only ever lost one game after resolving both Liliana's. Only one. I exile your Liliana. Very Con! 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 When sideboarding against big mana decks such as Tron, be sure to bring in three Fulminator Mages, give a firm handshake when offering the concession, and calmly, legibly, sign your name on the slit next to the zero as you remember that this is the deck that you signed up to play. God damn it. <sighs> now that's Jundanum Good. Colgan's Command is a card that offers way more than three mana's worth of value. All four modes are usually relevant, but at its ceiling, this card is basically three mana time walk plus a bonus effect. I mean, have you ever draw step discarded your opponent's prime time and brought back a binned Fulminator Mage? Oh, play was so sweet, it literally made me nauseous. Either that or my opponents need to wash their hands better after coming back from the bathroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so. So, so we're in for two, and I'm gonna start packing hand sanitizer. Excuse me. Okay. A one of Maelstrom Pulse acts as the deck's tactical nuke, blasting away any sort of <clears throat> unsightly permanence that Jund has a hard time dealing with, such as uh, white planeswalkers that'll go unnamed. I'll spit these sickish shit. I'm glad you did.
It also doubles as kind of a pseudo sweeper against most token strategies. I mean, have you ever won for 54 to Storm Player before? Straight value. And finally, we have the tippy top of the curve, the woman of the hour, Bloodbraid Elf. So 4 mana 3-2 haste by itself is not terribly exciting, but Bloodbraid Elf is the belle of the ball, and show up stag, she does not. How about a 4 mana 3-2 haste and her best gal pal Liliana? <laughs> Which one? Don't give a f Or how about a 4 mana 3-2 haste and a Tarmogoyf? Just a lady taking her dog out for a walk, and uh, yes, he bites. Or how about a 4 mana 3-2 haste and literally anything? The intoxicating nature of this card's power cannot be understated. Once in a game versus Titan Shift, I minused a Lily on the last hope to return a Fulminator Mage to my hand, but in doing so, I milled a Bloodbraid Elf. I, hand to God, legitimately thought to myself, well, I mean, a Fulminator Mage is good, but a Bloodbraid Elf could cascade into anything. Even a Fulminator Mage. Pro tip, don't be an idiot, just Take the Fulminator Mage, okay? Why am I reliving this memory on camera? I don't f***ing understand myself. Now that's Shundanum Good. <laughs> the mana base is very standard, as you can see here, so I'm not gonna waste your time going into all the details. Someone much smarter than me did all the math, and I am not about to argue with them. We are running the accepted mixture of fetches, shocks, fast lands, our one of treetop village, and our ravines. Our sweet, sweet ravines. Jund is renowned for being a deck that always improves post board. This is because the Jund colors offer access to some of the most flexible cards in the format, and most of these cards are both strong and have utility in multiple matchups. While there are some cards on the board that I would strongly recommend running at least one or two copies of, several slots of the 15 are meta dependent and you'll likely find yourself shifting them about to keep up with changes in your local meta or the meta of an expected event. Kicking things off, we have a Yu-Gi-Oh card? Oh god, this shit's so hard to make out, I can't even read her name. <laughs> oh wait, here it is, plain as day. 5-4 Indestructible with Haste! F*** you! That's her name! Thanks to Jund operating comfortably when Hellbent, Hazard is able to quickly shut the door on your opponents in matchups like Burn and Scapeshift, as well as present an indestructible blocker against the Mirror and Exile-like color combinations like Grixis and Teemer. Huntsmaster the Fells does it all, literally every single thing. She punishes opponents for casting too many or too few spells on a turn, generates life gain, shocks your opponents and their creatures, puts two bodies on the field, and on top of all of that, has Tramp. Fulminator Mage makes matchups like Tron and Balakot not entirely unwinnable. Now, these matchups are already so poor that I would not waste three sideboard slots for them alone. No. Fulminator Mage is much more versatile than that. It can come in against really any matchup where you just have dead cards that need to be replaced and nothing better to side in. But where I really feel this card shines is versus control. Jam it and just start swinging in for two. Eventually, they're gonna have to answer it, and when they do, you get a cheekily blow up a colonnade on the stack. That, my friends, is a beating. Jund has a storied and cultured tradition of running more copies of main deck cards in the board. I proudly carry on that tradition with a sideboard copy of Maelstrom Pulse. Sometimes you just need more of a good thing. Ancient Grudge, because affinity, Lantern and Kirk Clan Ironworks are all decks. Either run two and never get paired against them, or don't get paired against them and wish you did. That's just science. That being said, I'm only running one. Collective Brutality. Is it removal? Is it hand disruption? Is it life drain? Like any prostitute worth their salt, it's whatever you want it to be. An absolute beating versus burn and storm, and usually solid versus other combo and control. Flexible indeed. Anger of the Gods is my sweeper of choice, pulling double duty, hating against creature-based strategies like humans, elves, and all the various Coco nonsense going on, and as graveyard hate for Dredge and Hollow One. Also, it won't usually just straight genocide my goyfs, so, you know, anger over damnation. Engineered Explosives is another versatile sweeper that does not necessarily pose a threat to my permanence. It's excellent at clearing out tokens, etched champions, bogles, and is all around just the bee's knees. 
Damping Sphere is the newest addition to the board, and uh, if you don't know about Damping Sphere, uh, let me tell you about Damping Sphere. It's a two-mana artifact that reads, Tron and Storm players totally tilt out. Of course it has utility outside of these matchups, but those are the only two that I really hate losing to, so uh, you know, in for two. Rakdos Charm is superb in the current meta. It just provides so many useful modes even within a single matchup. Quite happy with this sick piece of tech as a one-of. My dedicated graveyard hate of choice is a one-of Graph Digger's Cage. Cage not only offers hate for graveyard strategies, but also gives you some protection against Coco, Nahiri, and the immensely relevant Panglacial Worm that one time. <laughs> Not on my watch, crafty brewer just trying to have a good time. The fun police are here. The deck is strong, no doubt, but more importantly, it is interactive, it's fun to play, and it rewards a skilled pilot. So, do I recommend it? Well, ignoring the fact that it's a roughly 4.62% of the meta, is 50-50 versus most decks game one, and is the deck of choice of the number two player in the world, I just made a 15 plus minute video on a Japanese gaming channel gushing over it, so uh, yeah, I recommend it. I hope you enjoyed this style of deck tech. If you did, please go ahead and check out some of my other Japanese game reviews. I review games in Japanese, in Japan, before they come out to the West, so anything you want to see, you're going to get the review here first. Dragon Quest XI? Reviewed it months ago. You can watch it here. It's not out there yet, unless you're in the future, in which case it's out there, but that's besides the point. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, specifically Sean Van Pelt, your champion buddy. All of you are champions. Thank you so much for your support. If you would like to support the channel, you like my content, go ahead and check out my link to my Patreon down below. There are a lot of sweet rewards, immediate things that you can get for supporting me, and uh, you're helping uh, expand my dream and my, my empire. Oh, of, of all these almost ten of thousands of subscribers, almost. But anyway, so yeah, go ahead and check me out on Twitter, check me out on Twitch, streaming three days a week over on Twitch. They're usually Japanese video games, but also gonna start me doing magic one or two days a week on Mako, it's gonna be good. But uh, yeah, that's everything. So thank you again for watching. In the meantime, I guess we're done.